New Testament to the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> One of the most important passages anywhere in the Word of God, <clears throat> beginning with uh, verse 27, Mark 8, 27. <clears throat> Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. We've been talking in these mornings together about prayer and particularly about intercessory prayer. We said there's a basic assumption that runs through Scripture when it deals with prayer, and that assumption is that something can happen in me that will make a difference in the possibilities in somebody else's situation. Something can happen in you that will make a difference in the possibilities, the redemptive possibilities in somebody else's life. Now, I'm I'm very grateful for that. Because if that's not true, what's the point in praying? It's a waste of your time if it can't make a difference in somebody beside you. Now, we also said that in a part of this, going along with this assumption or an expression of it is that the key to everyone's salvation lies in someone else. Now, that comes as a shock to many people when you, they hear me say it. And it came as a shock to me when I first began thinking it. But that's certainly true of physical life. I did nothing to get physical life. The fact that I'm alive is the result of the choice and the actions of two other people. And I was actually born in somebody else, born in some, conceived and born in somebody else's body. Now, that physical reality is a divinely established parable for spiritual life as well. We are born out of what goes on in the heart of God, and we are born out out of what goes on in the hearts of somebody other than ourselves. I wouldn't be surprised at all that the fact that I'm a Christian is due to the fact that the one who bore me in her womb for nine months also bore me in her heart because she was the first person who ever talked to me about my sins and my need of salvation. Now, 
That is a shock to American individualism because we think we all do it on our own and we think everybody else is responsible for doing it on his own or her own. And we're wrong on both scores. On the one, it makes us feel that we can do it. And on the other, it makes us feel that the other guy's responsible because he doesn't do it. And that always leaves us in a favorable position. But the reality is that that fact ought to be very humbling and ought to put a sense of responsibility on us very profound and very deep. Now, the supreme illustration of this and the proof of this is that there is no salvation anywhere except in one person. And that one person is Jesus Christ. And if you're a member of the family of God today, the only reason you're a member of the family of God is because what happened in the heart and soul and body of Jesus Christ. Because he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the light. There's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we can be saved. It is, he is the key to our salvation, to all salvation, and he is the key to the ultimate historical fulfillment of the purposes of God in the world that we will find when Christ comes again and establishes his eternal kingdom. It's all in him. Now, there's a sequitur that follows from that. And that's the one that we have not developed in American evangelicalism. And that is that the hope of the world is in the body of Christ. As our hope as the body of Christ is in Christ, the hope of the world is in the body of Christ. That means that the hope of the world lies in you and me and we will, we will give a report when we stand in the eternal judgment for what we have done with that responsibility. We've already said that the scripture indicates this very clearly. When it says, Jesus says to Peter, I'll, I'll build my church on this rock and I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom. Now he was not talking to Peter, the Pope. He was talking to this body of believers that at that time had in it 12 people, these apostles that were his. And they were the key for it being spread beyond. They were the ones that he sent out by the 12. And they were at the heart of the group that he sent out by 70. And they were at the heart of the 120 on the day of Pentecost. On Easter Sunday evening, after he had risen from the dead that morning, He came into that upper room where they were with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. And he said to me, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. Now the Father sent him to be our redemption. Now he's sending them to be the world's redemption. And he says, whosoever sins ye forgive, they will be forgiven. And whosoever sins you bind, they will be bound. Now, that's a Semitic way of expressing, and don't take it too literally in the sense that they had the power to forgive sins. They were simply the means by which people could hear the message of Christ, believe in Christ, and find their salvation in Christ, but it comes through the messengers. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings, that publish peace, We are the means through which that gospel in all its mystery and glory shall be sent to the world. And he said, you're the light of the world. Now, at one point, he said he was the light of the world. And at another point, he says, we are the light of the world. Now, maybe you ought to get that straight. No, he's, he's exactly straight when he says it because he is the light for us and we are to be the light for the world around us. That is the role of the body.